Hey friends, our guest today needs no introduction if you already know who he is. If you have never met him, he was an English teacher for the better part of three decades with a bunch of that stretch at the Dallas High School. He has influenced countless lives with his compassion, care, understanding, and storytelling ability. Anyone who took his class can fondly remember him standing at the front of the room, both hands stretched in front of him, eyes closed, deep in a 10-second pause before diving into the rest of the story. He did what you hope teachers will do, which is inspire and motivate kids to be the best that they can be. I feel grateful I had the chance to sit down with this man. Here he is, my friend, Kevin Kramer. This is a unique situation to, uh, I, was, I was thinking about it and I was like, I probably haven't seen you since June of 2002, the day I graduated. Yeah. Well, I ran into you at the uh, gas station Texaco. You were working there in the Dallas. Oh, okay. Yeah, I did work there for a while. Right after high school, probably, or during. Mm, yeah, I worked there for a couple of years. Yeah, but it's it's been some years. And uh, when I started doing this, I'm always thinking of people I can sit down with. And you had always been one of the people at the top of the list. And the only way I knew how to get a hold of you was through Tony Rowland. <laughs> so he, I, I sent him a message a while ago, and I said, hey, what's up with Kramer? Do you ever talk to him? He said, I saw him last night. <laughs> and so that was, uh, that was pretty cool that uh, that could happen. And I, I appreciate you driving down here to hang out with me. Well, I appreciate you having me. This is interesting. It's good to see you too, by the way. Thank you. You were one of my uh, favorite students. I appreciate uh, that. Yeah, the, uh, the, reason, the reason that I thought it would be so cool to have you down here is because I don't, I don't want to embarrass you, but I don't know if you know – your status amongst people who went to school there and the way that you are regarded as a teacher. How long did you teach there? 20 years? 25 years? Uh, 31. 31, 31 years. years yeah. You are, you were, you were an English teacher mm -hmm. and you, I've never heard anybody say anything negative about you. In all the <laughs> you uh, there, there's an air about you where you um, you just seem so confident and cool and in control and willing to let people be people, and that's a very important skill. Well, I had very good mentors. Norm Ton, he was one that helped me quite a bit. Mm -hmm. Les Jensen. Walt Smith, I don't know if he was there when you were there. He's, I don't know any of those people. These guys were special. So what year did you start teaching? 1979. 1979. How old were you? Uh, I think I was 22. Wow. Yeah. Brain cells are starting to <laughs> leave. But yeah. That's, it was a long time. But yeah. it was more of a hobby than – I think it, it's important to have a passion that you can – turn into a career, mm -hmm. and then it's not really work or a labor. It's more there's a passion involved in it. Yeah. And I think that's what it really helps in life to find that passion. And that could lead you to a number of doors that would open up. Mm -hmm. And it works pretty good for me, or it did. Well, yeah, that's what they say, right? Mm -hmm. uh, find, find a way to make money that you enjoy, you'll never work a day in your life, right? And I think service to others is a big deal of that. You know, it's um, kind of like Les Schwab, you know, like where your father worked. Mm -hmm. at, at one time, they provided service to people, and he, he seemed to take care of his workers pretty well. Mm -hmm. I mean, he respected them, mm -hmm. paid them well, et cetera. So I think that's an important part of it, too. Mm -hmm. But when you got in there in 1979, oh. did, did you have any idea what you were doing? Did you did you understand those things? I was terrified. <laughs> <laughs> you, you were only a few years older than the kids you were teaching. Yeah, I was That's terrified. That's crazy. You know, and uh, it took me probably about seven years, I think, before you're really comfortable, mm -hmm. where you can walk in and, and when you teach – 
that if, you know, everything ends early and there's 15, 20 minutes left, what are you going to do? Yeah. You know, and that's the the part where you you need to feel comfortable and you need to have uh, administrators that can help nurture you. Mm-hmm. And I think that's really important. I've been fortunate to have really good principles for the most part. Mm-hmm. How, how involved are the principals? What what can they actually dictate or re- require? Well, were you around when we did the uh, Great Gatsby Galas? Uh, yes, I was. <laughs> I'll have to show you a picture after this. <laughs> I still got one, yeah. Well, when we when we did that, I, I remember I was in the auditorium and uh, Mr. Kent Smith, really good guy, was, was having some problems with certain individuals. Mm-hmm. You know, I would have them later next year. <laughs> they turned out to be great kids. But um, he had asked them to quiet down, and they wouldn't. It was during a choir concert. I was getting blown away by the band and the choir. And we were studying The Great Gatsby at that time. Mm-hmm. And he he kind of woke me up from my amazement. Mm-hmm. You know. I said, what, Mr. Kramer, I need your help over here. So I walked over there, and there was a conversation going back and forth between these guys and Mr. Smith. And, and all of a sudden, I, I got kind of upset. And the next thing I knew, Mr. Rowland was laughing at me. <laughs> and we marched the boys down. And uh, they took care of them down there and came into the room, and I was a little upset. And I said, you guys want to write 15 million essays on The Great Gatsby and do about 15 tests over it? Or do you want to have a party? Well, it was probably one of the smartest group of kids that I had. Mm -hmm. And they said, we want a party. I said, go get the principal. And they started throwing ideas up on the board. And Mr. Puskarich, Jim Puskarich came in. Mm -hmm. And he's looking at me. And you never want to put your boss on the spot like that. You know, you want to prepare him. Mm -hmm. He came in and he's listening to all these ideas and everything. And he goes... He looked at me, <laughs> and I thought, oh, I'm dead. <laughs> he says, come outside, Mr. Kramer. I don't care what you do with these kids. I just want them to be successful. And you go see Mona, and she's got some money for stamps and public relations, and, and she'll get you started on this and then see what else we can do for you. And, the, and he just went. Now, that's leadership. Nice. That's a principal that supports teachers. Mm-hmm. And he was very involved with uh, the wrestling program and football and everything. He was a coach at one time. So I've always seen that teachers that go into administration, you know, if they've taught for 10, 15 years, I think they're very effective principals. But guys that have a short experience in the classroom, it, it's more difficult, I think, for them. Yeah. Well, it's probably difficult to get that job anyway if you don't have teaching experience, right? I would hope so. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, because, I mean, y- you got to understand what the people below you are dealing with, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. 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 So I, while you were there over the years, what, what was the general consensus in terms of whether or not teachers really cared about what they were doing? Because you're, you're always going to have a, a wide range of talent mm-hmm. and some people who are just doing it for a paycheck and then other people that really just care about, like, trying to influence the youth. And, I mean, what, what did you experience? Were, were the majority of people, like, decent and really trying hard? Man, when I, when I started teaching the Dallas, which was uh, in 1985, 86, and I taught it with Tonka for two my year. In both schools, it was really the morale was high, mm-hmm. and uh, you know there might might have been I you know there's you'd get a young teacher in and they'd get overwhelmed or something, and uh, I think they had mentors that would help them out, and uh, I thought it went pretty good. But I think most teachers went in there. I think most of them had success as students. Uh, They were also interested in other things, maybe like music or art, you know, so they came in with some passions. And I think most, I'd say about, I'd say about 90% of them. Yeah? That high, at at least when I was going through. Wow. And um, 
that was pretty good, I think. Some of them, <laughs> some of them, there was a few things, a few times where you'd go into the lunchroom or something and they'd be talking about how tough their test was and you're, and I'm going, mm-hmm. <laughs> well, if it's that tough, you know, are you getting the job done teaching? Them? Yeah. So I... Well, it's such a challenging job, and uh, th- most teachers don't get a lot of credit for what they do because, one, you're getting a salary, mm-hmm. uh, which is in almost every place not very high. So you're not getting paid a ton. You're responsible for molding humans. Mm-hmm. Uh, your your day starts, what, at least an hour before school. Then you're doing stuff for an hour or two after school. you got to grade papers, prepare things, like – it's like a life job. It's not like you you clock in at nine and you're done at five and you go to the beach or something. Yeah, there's a lot of preparation. Uh, took me about three or five minutes to grade an essay, you know, to make comments and stuff, mm-hmm. uh, depending on the length, you know. Some, or how good some, it was. <laughs> yeah. And uh, you learn pretty quick to, uh, you know, if you put red marks all over a kid's paper, and that's something I had to learn early. It's not it, – it hits them just – Four or five things you want them to work on. Yeah. And, uh, you know, Dr. Phil, I think, has it right for every negative. You better find 100 positives, especially when you're raising your own kids. Mm-hmm. You know, I I really believe that. I think valuing a, a young student because it's tough in high school. I think it's tougher than when I was growing up right now. With the, you know, the demographics and everything and just deploy. Absolutely. You know, I— my last 10 years of teaching, I was eating in the classroom quite often, you know, and kids would keep the door open. They'd come in and talk, and I wasn't a counselor by any means, but I'm, I'm hearing stuff like they're taking Prozac in high school, <laughs> and I'm going, whoa, and Adderall, and, you know, I'm just going, wow, you know, that's <laughs> – tell me more. Yeah. I remember sitting down with this young kid, and uh, I said, hey – you got a D in my class right now, but look at all this. Can you just turn one or two of these things in and you're a good enough writer? You might get a C or B here. You know, can, can you take some homework home and work on it? Can you, you know, read a little uh, Catcher in the Rye? And she said, Mr. Kramer, I don't have any lights. And I said, what? I'm living in a storage oh, storage facility. You know, they're just, they got a box and that's where they're living. And I'm going... I mean, that just was, she didn't get a D. Yeah. <laughs> and I just go, man. But, you know, as a teacher, you got to find ways to reward their efforts. And um, I just have to justify a grade. You know, I didn't consider myself a real hard grader, but, you know, to get an A, you had to, you had to have some outstanding work. But, yeah. Boy, you know, I think I think high school is like the tip of the iceberg of the rest of your life. <laughs> That's that is a huge thing that I was thinking about when I knew you were coming down here. I'm like, when you when you are in that stretch of time in your life, that's that's all there is. You think that's the end of everything. And it kind of is because you haven't done anything else. Mm-hmm. But then you get 5, 10, 20 years out. Like I'm 19 years out now. Wow. I'm like, that that was nothing. It didn't mean anything. Yeah. All those people that I knew or hung out with or whatever and all the drama that happened, like it was insignificant to where I am now. Mm-hmm. And people get so wrapped up in uh, the cliques that they're in and, and these sports and doing all the stuff that they're doing. Mm-hmm. They just think that that is the end of life. Yeah. And really it's like uh, I guess my – Highlights of my life would be marrying my wife, Vana, and then having three kids. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and I mean, just watching them grow and being a part of their lives is huge. Mm-hmm. I mean, there's nothing better. And you want to, you know, I try to tell that to students, you know, I just say, hey, you know, this is this is a little piece, but you want to prepare yourself for the big picture later on. And, you know, you, you're going to be going down a road and there's going to be a whole bunch of doors open and. I think the doors that open easy are the ones you're supposed to open, you know, in in terms of career paths and marriage and things like that. You know, you shouldn't have to work real hard. 
You think they just kind of happen? They just kind of present themselves? In my life, it's been that way. Yeah. I mean, there's been certain people that have come in and just drastically changed things for me. And um, I, I think that's, <laughs> I think the old man upstairs, he's, <laughs> you know, he's got a sense of humor. <laughs> and uh, so, you, you know, he's got a paintbrush. And I think there's there's some kind of, plan behind it and you know i just i just feel there's just kind of been a at certain times in my life when i've needed it there's been a push to go a certain way and things just opened up like mm -hmm. when i became a teacher at the dallas high school there was like 143 teachers applied for my position well i knew people well it was a really tough time to get a teaching job you beat 142 people well i had i was dual certified in history and english and i could coach and so that kind of moved you up the litter. Yeah. And they, especially now, um, schools are penalized if they have to misassign a teacher. <laughs> you know, I have a history teacher teach English without a degree in it. So it's, it gets tough that way. So they, they, like, they like the easy stuff. I didn't even know that that could happen. You could, you could go to school to be a PE teacher and get stuck teaching science? Mm-hmm. You in, don't know anything about in, science. In the old days. Well, uh, if, if, you went to, <laughs> if you went to the University of Oregon, they're taking the same courses that the nurses and doctors take, the uh -huh. preliminary courses, and then they separate, you know, like after grad school or okay. in grad school. But yeah, they're pretty tough. A lot of science, a lot of kinesiology, physiology. <laughs> That's why I became an English teacher. <laughs> <laughs> Was it pretty obvious when you were going to school? Is that what you knew? I didn't know it. <laughs> I had a great experience in high school. Dennis Radford, uh, a number of teachers, you know, were real strong role models for me. And um, wrestling was kind of a a doorway to an education for me. I was the first one in my family to get a college degree. And um, I ended up at the University of Oregon, and I had a, a wrestling coach that uh, cared more about the individual than win-loss records. He wanted you to graduate. Mm -hmm. So my, my junior year, when you're supposed to declare a major, he calls me in his office. And I thought, am I in trouble? And he's looking at my transcripts, and he goes, Krams, says here you're a political science major. Yeah, coach, I am. He says, how come you've only taken one class in political science and this is the start of your junior year? And I go, well, I, I took that class and, hey, that political science class, hey, there was, they weren't very happy people. They were arguing all the time and they were upset and they were angry. And, and uh, I, I just, he said, well, you got to declare a major this year. And I go, oh, you got all these history credits, all these English credits. Which one do you want? Well, I like them both. <laughs> He says, you're going to be a good teacher, I think. Hey, go history. Call this guy. Boom. And he sent me off to talk to a counselor in the, in the mm -hmm. program. And he had been a high school teacher and really enjoyed it. And God, was this, that's what I'm saying about doors opening for you and somebody guiding you. Yeah. Yeah, because, I mean, your life would have had a way different trajectory, right, if you would have oh. – yeah. Yeah. You know, you, and I think more of that needs to happen, especially now. I think from what I've seen, kids are in the future going to be looking at and the jobs, you know, they're going to be changing jobs. I mean, teaching has changed so much. When I first started teaching, you'd take attendance on a piece of paper, write it on a piece of paper and hang it on the door. Mm hmm. And a kid would come around and get it, and then you had to make sure that oh, you know, I remember <laughs> they didn't scratch the name <laughs> yeah. out, say oh, tardy, yeah, you know, and all that, you know. Now and then they went to bubble sheets, and then they went to a computer in the room where you take roll, and they've got the picture of the kid there, and you know, and seating charts and the whole thing. It's crazy. And you push you push a letter grade, and it's converted to percentage, and that percentage keeps a daily total of the grade in the classroom. So it's mm. not something where you have to go back over the grade book and manually do it. It's all like that. And parents can see it on their computers at home. Mm. So this whole idea of accountability and 
and um, transparency. <laughs> and if you're, I got better at computers, but it was it was <clears throat> <laughs> tough at first. I'm just going on. <laughs> yeah. Well, there's there's also different ways of expressing talent or knowledge or experience. I, I have a relative who basically can't read. Mm -hmm. or, no, no, no. Sorry. He, he can't spell very well. Uh, but he's an incredible auto body expert. Like he can take a car apart, mm -hmm. paint every piece and put it back together in his cherry. Yeah. But he just, he can't spell very well. So his, there's something in his brain mm -hmm. that doesn't allow him to do that. But that doesn't mean he's not insanely talented at something else. Right. And so in, I don't know what grades he got in school, but I imagine he didn't do very well because spelling is like one of the main things you do. Yeah. yeah. I always I was gave two grades for an essay. One was for content, expression, ideas, uh, the voice. And then I, the other grade was grammar, you know, punctuation. Yeah. And spelling. And... So it, you, know, you could have an A here and maybe a C here or D here, and you still get a decent grade out of the deal. Um, if they turn a paper and I never <laughs> – I didn't flunk a kid yeah. unless I found out that they'd uh, downloaded something. Which <laughs> well, yeah, that, that probably didn't become an issue until what, like 99 or something? Yeah, somewhere in there. But I had one student who – God, I felt like an idiot too because I got up in class and I read the essay and – no, 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 no. I hadn't read a whole bunch of Hemingway at that time. <laughs> and this individual had copied A Big Two-Hearted River, and this wonderful piece, you know. I mean, it was beautiful. A plus, A plus. And I discovered it later on my own. I was reading, you know, reading some of Hemingway's stuff because we're going to do Old Man in the Sea, and I'm going. And I remember that from fall quarter. And oh, oh, no. I saved this, you know. <laughs> Word for word. <laughs> oh, man, you can't do that. It was beautiful. No, you can't. <laughs> Not word for word. Come on. No, that's when I was first starting in the Dallas, you know, so I hadn't been familiar with the curriculum and everything. Like, <laughs> that was funny. Well, yeah, that's the other thing I wanted to ask you. I mean, there's a hundred things I want to ask you, but um, did you ever get tired of doing the same stuff? No. It's all different. Yeah, but, I mean, you had – six books, six or 10 books that you mm -hmm. had to go through every quarter for 31 years? You didn't get tired of it? Oh, the, no. The classics, you don't get tired of. You see something new in it each time as you grow as a person. Yeah. Um, for example, the Iliad, huge book, huge. Yeah. I wish everybody would read it because when you were a teenager, when I read it the first time, it was all about war and yeah, glory, yeah. I was all fired up. Yeah. You know? As an adult, when you read it, you really find out what Homer was trying to say yeah. about war, how how it all ca was caused by the seven deadly sins. You know, classic literature focuses on, you know, hubris, pride, um, avarice, greed, lechery, my favorite, um, <laughs> uh, sloth and uh, ang wrath and all these. Mm -hmm. Well, the Iliad encompasses all of those in – it's the first novel. It's the first uh, tragic novel. And when I read that, I just went, you know, as an older person, each time I read it, I see something new in it. Um, when Achilles' best friend, Patroclus, dies, he transfers his anger from Agamemnon, who's insulted him, and he's withdrawn from the fighting. He's, he's kind of like a professional football player that gets upset, like Aaron Rodgers. Mm -hmm. Perfect example. Yeah. I hope they lose without me. He's pouting. You know, and part of it, you have to sell to kids, too. It's like, For sure. You know, you have to sell it. You know, teaching is some acting, quite a bit of it. But he gets angry with Agamemnon, this king. He's the authority figure, et cetera, and he tries to – he challenges him in front of everybody. And the king slaps him down, humiliates him. So he withdraws from the fighting. His best friend, who's a patriot – Kind of like that football player from the St. Louis Cardinals, Pat Tillman. Okay. His safety. He was, you know, he was making six million a year, eight million. And then he decided when the towers fell in 2000, 2001. One, yeah, he joins up in the service and then he's killed in 
in Afghanistan. I know what you're talking about yeah. now. Yeah. Pat Patroclus, Pat Tillman, you know, they're the same. So you can take modern situations and adapt them. Well, Achilles gets all upset. Patroclus begs Achilles to go and fight him. He won't do it because he's proud. But he lets Patroclus wear his armor. Patroclus is killed. Achilles transfers the anger to every Trojan that is alive, and he goes into to battle. And, and the carnage, and it depends which translation you read to, but here's this image of this Achilles in this golden armor flying across the battlefield in these chariots. The undercarriage of the horses is all viscera and blood and gore. The chariot's a mess with all this stuff, and he's blood spattered. He's like the, the god of war R.E. He's going across, and the sun is shining on him, and it's this idea of glory. Well, Homer paints a horrible picture of that. And the Greeks looked at Ares, the god of war, as the most cowardly. They built no temples to him, nothing. When he finally kills Hector, the guy that killed his best friend, he ties him to a, a chariot, drags him by his heels every day. And I always tell the kids, I say, hey, how many dead bodies are you dragging behind your Volvo? <laughs> You know, we never let stuff go. Yeah. We can cut it loose. Um, it's kind of like what you're saying about high school and the cliques. And, you know, when do you, when do you get rid of that baggage in life? I don't think some people ever get rid of it. Some people carry that stuff forever. Yeah. Which is so disappointing. It's, yeah, it's a battle, you know. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it's like... To me, that's one of the great lessons in the book. And then finally at the end, when here's this kid, Achilles, who's about a little older than most high school kids probably. He's probably in his late 20s, mid-20s. He's this great person. He used to play it where he'd take prisoners, entertain them at dinner, and then sell them back to their parents. After that, he didn't do it anymore. But when he grabs his – when the – Hector's father comes in, grabs his knees, and begs for his son's body back. He, first, he's very angry, and then all of a sudden he goes, oh, crap. All this glory I've sought has just been to ruin him, hurt his family, hurt his friends. And what changes in me, there's this universal concept that he finally grasps and says, you know, we're all, we're all suffering in this world. And there's my father home alone because I had to come here because of pride. Yeah. And he hugs the old man and he goes and prepares the body himself, washes it, wraps it in a fine linen, puts it in the, the wagon for Priam, feeds Priam, accepts the gold ransom, not because he wants it, but because it honors his son mm -hmm. to take it. And that's how it ends with the burial of Hector. And I mean, you're just like this. And uh, I see something different each time I read a, a classic, something that stood the test of time that talks about conflicts of the heart. And that's what we should be teaching kids. Instead, we're doing these dendrite killing standardized tests that I lost. Remember, you did about six, seven books in my class. I was lucky to get through four of them because of the testing. Oh, as time went on. Well, these tests became more. You had to prepare kids. You had to take the test in class, practice tests. You had to, you know. Well, that's because that's how they give funding to the schools, right? If you can pass X, amount or X percentage of thresh threshold, then you get money. Mm -hmm. So it becomes, let's teach these kids how to pass tests. We got to teach them here. This thing, the tat, we got kids that are afraid to call people and talk to them on a the phone. I know. It's weird, right? And that's a detachment that we're seeing in violence in this country where people don't feel valued. I mean, they want, to, they want to blame guns and gun control and everything, but why are they pulling the trigger? Yeah. What's causing them to be so angry? They're detached and removed from society. They're, they don't sit down and talk about problems. Yeah. Well, I think that also has to do with the fact that you get famous. If they would not name... Blah, 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 shot up, 
14 people in a movie theater. What was his life like? What happened? What did his parents do? This guy, that thing. It's like, if you give them that notoriety, mm -hmm. I mean, for somebody who, who has issues, mental issues, and feels like they don't want their life anymore, that's a great option. Mm -hmm. Go shoot up a bunch of people and then you become infamous and mm -hmm. everybody's talking about you. Mm -hmm. It. I don't think they should even talk about the person. It just... I got I got really upset because you know they mental health is a huge crisis, and we lost probably half of funding to schools in the states in 1980 when Ronald Reagan became president, mm. and he did some good things, you know. But boy, that impacted me as a teacher, and that's when I started noticing the homeless population growing, and. Uh, you know, we used to have state hospital damage that had, I don't know how many, 1,100 beds or something like that. Try to find one now, you know? And uh, that was that was a significant change in education when I saw it. You know, they, they've got to teach art. They have to teach music. They have to have PE. They have to have these options for kids. You know, it's like I was talking to a counselor the other day, and he goes, what do we have at the Dallas High School that's going to keep a young man in, in going to school? Because they reduced the vocational. The, when I was in high school, they had a mechanics, welding. Wood shop. Wood shop, one, two, three, build a house. Um, a forge. You could, you know, sculpt metal. Wow. Uh, plus Carnegie and Leach, they had... Tremendous art program there, and um, photography. You know, they they have some of those things now, but not not to the degree they used to have. So, what do you do instead of all those electives? What do you take? More math, more reading, more history. Well, what I'd like to see happen in education, if if they let me be king, <laughs> someday. <laughs> um. Pay for junior college for kids tuition. Right now they're doing they're trying to do that in schools with AP and honors classes and things like that. So your second student teacher, student peer teaching opportunities away. And so they're they're taking like 20 kids, putting them in a class, and then they run them all day. And um, they go from AP Euro to AP. English to AP economics. So what it does is it if you're on a block schedule, you know, it cuts down your choices. Like band, music competes with those, art, photography, things that kids are gonna need. It's like I was reading a book, I can't remember the author's name, but the earth is hot, flat, and crowded. And this uh, gentleman was talking about the idea that He's a futurist, and he's talking about the jobs that we're preparing students for today haven't been created yet. Exactly. You know, and he was really pushing the green revolution about the opportunities that are going to be there for kids. Um, and he went to speak to China. <laughs> he was giving a, um, a speech over there in his book. He was talking about it, and they interrupted him. It's our turn now. You've been burning fossil fuels for so many years. Nah, 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 nah. And he goes, and he listened to all this backlash. And when they were done, he says, well, that's fine. Go ahead. But you're going to come to us when you want to have green technology. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it, that shut him up. Then he started thinking, you know. And, and they just have to find a way to make money at that stuff. And people will follow, you know. And it's going to take some government help in that area, too, to open up different avenues for that but you know why aren't we right now california has this huge drought going on why aren't they building desalination plants and bringing in ocean water yeah where's that why is that not in the picture yeah you know, i mean that's a that's a no-brainer for me yeah it, it's an interesting time because i think more so than any other time period in human history things are advancing so fast we can't keep up with anything yeah and like you said uh and like i tell my kids all the time i don't know what to tell them about whether or not they should go to college 
whether or not they should study a, a specific field because I really don't know what's going to happen. And so I think, I think there should be a bigger focus on somebody trying to figure out what that is and trying to prepare people almost like, a, like, a, like preparing you for a trade school, you know, not just giving everybody the same cookie cutter education, but like, hey, Jimmy is really good with his hands. He's mm -hmm. great at making stuff. Like he do, maybe he doesn't need to take as much yeah. history or maybe he doesn't need science as much, but let's put him in the wood shop and let him make stuff because he's really good. And then maybe he can become an engineer, you know, and work with 3D printing or something like that. Like there's no avenues for kids to figure this shit out. They mm -hmm. just get pushed into the, the machine. And then like you said, the, take the test, take the test, take the test. Let's get that funding. And I don't know. It just seems like no one. Well, I, I appreciate your frustration. I've thought about that. The most important piece of literature that I taught was Julius Caesar, mm -hmm. Shakespeare, because I'm haunted by Ben Franklin. In 1787, I think, or 89, when they were doing the Constitutional, when they were building the Constitution, they were up the top floor of the Freedom House where the bell was in Philadelphia. And when he came down the stairs after weeks, he was sweating. He had a fever. He'd be dead in two weeks. And he was the one that kept them from killing each other up there because <laughs> you had slave owners and you had merchants in the north and they were all fighting over just a bunch of, you know, horrible. They were afraid of too much power in the hands of a few people. They had to fight over religion, they had to hide uh, everything. So when they finally ironed it out, then they had to go get it ratified by the 13 colonies. Here comes Franklin down the steps. And a woman said, Mr. Franklin, what, what government do we have? Do we have? Do we have a monarchy? Do we have a democracy? Do we have a, a parliament? What do we have? He goes, Madam, you have a republic for as long as you can keep it. Now that being said, Every one of those students in my classroom has the opportunity to vote. To make the best choices, they got to be critical thinkers. Sure. And part of that's going to be know your history, be able to write, be able to communicate, be able to think critically. Literature like, <clears throat> excuse me, Shakespeare, wow. You can watch that again and again and again and go to a play again. And you, you see it on this big screen or you go to a play and it's different each time you see it. Yeah. And I think it's a teacher's job to be able to say, well, like <laughs> when we look at a play like, oh, Much Ado About Nothing, there's a lot of um, naughtiness in it. Even Hamlet was part comedy in parts. And I said, your job is to figure out why I'm laughing. That's what you told the students? Yeah. I said, hey, am I, if I'm laughing, it might be naughty. I'm not going to explain it to you. And then you just let him go. Or yeah. I don't know, were you there when I showed the movie Harold and Maude? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I never get tired of watching that movie. <laughs> it's more fun to watch kids go. Yeah. Yeah. You know. But those are things, and I think... I think it's really imperative that a teacher is allowed to teach something that they have a passion about. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's really the key because uh, they're the front line. And if, and if you can build a passion about something, like I would be horrible teaching economics, you know, I just, but there's some people that love it. Yeah. Oh, let's make some money. Let's do the taxes. Let's, let's buy some stocks. And <laughs> yeah. You know. Yeah. But literature, uh, history, you have to have both of those together. If you're just an English teacher and you don't have the history behind the literature, you, you know, that's a struggle. Yeah. Because you've got to figure out the time frame. It's like cancel culture today. You know, it's like the people I had at the University of Oregon, some of them that, that I took for history were history. I mean, this one guy, this falconary guy, talked to the Japanese diet, the whole Japanese Congress as we would, you know, spoke Japanese fluently to wow. him. You know, and he was over there with MacArthur and those guys. I mean, he had a big influence on me. Um, some guys, you know, were over there in Europe during the World War II, mm -hmm. you know, and they came over and they were just like, 
But I think what would make it real for a lot of people is go to Auschwitz. <laughs> like, Have I you did, been there? Yeah. I went to uh, Birkenau. It's changed your world. <laughs> it's it's insane. Yeah. You can't believe that that could happen. I was back there by the uh, the furnace. Mm-hmm. Just walking around. They have waiting rooms. One room where they got ready. One room where they got naked. Then the next room mm-hmm. where there was like a, a vent that came in. And you just can't believe it doesn't seem real. It doesn't seem like you could do that. Well, you've, you've got people that are easily led. They're sheep. And you saw it in Julius Caesar. Um, Brutus gets up there, gives us a funeral speech for Julius Caesar. I killed him, not because I didn't love him, but I loved Rome more. <laughs> yeah. And everybody applauds him and he leaves. Mark Antony gets in there, flips it, causes a huge riot. Look what happened at the Capitol. Yeah. You know, how did that happen? Are people thinking clearly? Are they, you know, and the the news media hasn't helped us out. No, everything's very confusing right now. Uh, People people get their news from social media, and that's not a reliable source. (laughs) You get sent, have you ever seen The Social Dilemma, the documentary on Netflix? No. There, There are algorithms by these companies, by Facebook, by Instagram, that know that if you start clicking on was uh, was the space landing real, they know what type of personality you are. And so they'll send you things that you're going to click on because it's a business. Yeah. They want you to click things. Mm-hmm. And so there's no – you don't get to see everything. Mm-hmm. You get narrowly pushed down that that area that your brain is already going. So yeah. there, there's no critical thinking. You're just getting fed – yeah. The things, it's confirmation bias. That's what I was mm-hmm. looking for. Yeah. So it's brutal. Yeah, it's horrible. And and I think, you know, the way the, the way they fund education with these justified tests, I mean, we spent, I looked it up and it was like, in Oregon, it's close to $22 million a year on the testing. And there's about eight companies that do these tests, so they're making some money. Nationwide, it's $1.9 billion. Hmm. Get rid of them. You've got an SAT, an ACT, and the uh, military, ASVAB. All three of those, the ASVAB's free. They want to get in and recruit kids. Uh, SAT and ACT are paid for by the, by the parents. They take, the kids take the test when they're ready. Those could be your exit exams. You know, and is, that a, is that an effective way to offer funding to schools? I don't know what the solution is, but it, it's obvious that the testing isn't a good way to do it. No. I think they have to trust educators. It seems like they need to give more money to the schools that suck. If your school is notoriously uh, like in the south side of Chicago and people are getting shot and everybody has – they're dropping out for their freshman year. Like it seems like you should give more money to them rather than the nice – school on the hill in Seattle. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Well, I think part of it's demographics. I think when people become successful, they move out of, they move up. Yeah. And unless you're Spike Lee or Magic Johnson who goes into those neighborhoods and rebuilds them, Mm -hmm. um, you got to take your hat off to those men. I mean, that's genius. That's that's what needs to happen. And uh, that takes some courage. You know, you have to go in and refurbish and retool and, and um, maybe kick a few butts. Yeah. You know, I yeah. mean, you know, I, I, I'm an educator, so I'm, I know I'm extremely biased. I think everybody should be able to appreciate certain forms of literature they're choosing. Uh, History is important because, you know, is, is it going to really make a difference if you tear down a statue? Yeah. Now, Statues put up after the civil rights movement, after, you know, 1908, after the KKK, you know, those don't need to be out. But statues that were put up shortly after the Civil War and everything, that's part of grieving, I think. Yeah. And uh, we certainly don't want another civil war. <laughs> so I, we're getting close. You know, I mean, Auschwitz is standing there for a reason. Yeah. And when I went there, and I still just kind of, it was like... 
<laughs> they had rooms bigger than three times the size of this. From the ceiling to a wall here was plexiglass. One room was nothing but overcoats, stuffed to the ceiling, pressed up against the glass. The next one was artificial limbs. The next one was dentures. The next one was shoes. On and on, it was like processed cattle. Yeah. Hair, human hair pressed to the, I mean, from the floor to the ceiling, no space. And I just sat there and looked. And then the ovens, oh, geez. I mean, it was then the gas. Uh, and yet, when I was teaching at the high school, I got a letter from somewhere in Klickitat of a person that denied the Holocaust. <laughs> I just, yeah, that's crazy. We need to send them over there and just walk the grounds, you know. Mm -hmm. I mean, when I was over there, I was a high school um, senior, just graduated. And um, people were sobbing all over. You know. And the kid that I was our guide, he was from New York. He was on a wrestling team over there. He was, um, his name was Emil, and his uh, grandfather had been shot at this big wall, backstop basically with flowers covering the whole thing. And he was looking at that, and that's the first time he'd ever seen it or been there. And he, it was, he was crying. I'm going, what's, are you okay? And, he, and then he told me the story. And I'm going, what causes people to do that? Mm -hmm. What kind of, what kind of hate do you have to generate and doubt? And... Yeah, it's it's hard to imagine. And the crazy thing is, we've been doing it forever. It's not new. It's just that is the newest one. Mm -hmm. Uh, yet you're talking about the the wall when I was there, and I think I said Birkenau earlier, but I meant Dachau. Dachau. Yeah, outside of um, Munich. Yeah, outside of Munich, I think. Uh, behind the ovens, they had this little walkway, and it looks like you're in the forest in Oregon. Germany's very similar to Oregon, just mm -hmm. with the trees and the landscape and the weather and everything. And you can walk back there in this trail behind the ovens, and they had a wall where they would line people up and shoot them. Yeah. And the only thing I could think of when I was back there was if there is some living personality inside trees or anything that exists in nature, oh. and that tree, if there is something in it, had to be there for all of that carnage oh my god it's brutal yeah and you just like feel it come on you when you're standing there you're like man i can't imagine the things that happen in this place the terror and it's nuts well i was, was teaching in portland before i came to the dows <clears throat> i was out with a bunch of t teachers in a chinese restaurant on uh, mclaughlin and this waitress came, right? It was like a Tuesday night, so there was hardly anybody there. And this waitress was coming and bringing our plates in and everything. And she was dressed in this blouse and uniform and everything. And she put some tea down, and on her arm, there were numbers. Mm. Yeah. And I looked at her and go, and she didn't look at me or anything. She just went off. So I would excuse myself, and I walked over, and I said, uh, excuse me, I don't want to embarrass you or anything, but are those numbers representative of a concentration camp and she goes yeah and as a little girl she was at Auschwitz and her parents all died there I had her come in and talk to my classroom she'd never done any public speaking or anything but you could have taken a pen and just maybe just gonna, <laughs> she took you know she told her experiences she saw Hitler speak you know on her dad's shoulders Whoa. yeah she was Austrian and Catholic and so one of the misconceptions is he was eugenics. I mean, he was going through the six million Jews, probably a lot more. Um, they said five million gypsies, Russians, Catholics, anybody that. Pro I mean, they were just systematically just weeding out society, and uh, and for people to allow that to happen, you know, they voted him in. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. and that's a scary thing. I mean. <sighs> Do we get the best people running for office? You know, I, I don't know. It's a, it's a tough call, and that's why you know, I and Mr. Tan shared that with me. He said, you know, that Julius Caesar is really an important play. You know, and it's it's tough to teach, but it's deep. I yeah, mean, and you start 
we had a trial. We kind of did a trial, kind of like the Huckleberry Finn uh, debate. I don't know if you remember that, where we had to, you guys had to choose the strongest uh, theme in the book and argue that it was the the strongest theme. And we had a big debate. And Vaguely. Points and everything. You had to do some art and everything. Well, they had to come up and find out who was, who was the cause of the whole thing. And was it justified homicide and all this? You know, it's, but it's hard. Well, the thing is, if you compared a 16-year-old boy or girl in 2021 to a 16-year-old boy or girl in 1950 or in 1850, those are three radically different people. Yeah. The attention span today uh, with TikTok videos and everything that's going on, like – you are getting bombarded constantly mm-hmm. and you don't have a chance. Like it's, it's, it's like smoking rocks, mm-hmm. but it's in a, it, a TV screen that you're staring at mm-hmm. on your phone. Like everything's just firing a million miles an hour. So when you go back and you try to read the Iliad, mm-hmm. they're not going to pay attention to that. You go, you give that book to somebody in 1950. They'd probably do better. 1850, they'll pick up Moby Dick. Sure, no problem. Mm-hmm. That was that was the best thing that you could ever get. But when did it come out? 1880, 1890? Yeah, somewhere in there. Whenever mm-hmm. it came out, yeah. I'm sure that was that was like watching 30 episodes of Keeping Up with the Kardashians. Back That's, to back to back to back, you know? But you have to train you have to train students to see pictures here when they read. Mm-hmm. If they're not getting those pictures, you know, and that's creativity. And that's what I was all about is that creative aspect and critical thinking. Mm -hmm. And they have to be able to see those pictures. And as a teacher, that's your job. Whatever material you're teaching, et cetera, you've got to throw it out there and and expect challenges coming back. And this was a tough one. (laughs) Yeah. I'm not going to say I was successful at it. I just say put it on my desk and they wouldn't do it. (laughs) Yeah. I said, now you have to take it to the office. They go put it in their locker. And I'd call Mona, Mona, did this kid come down? So, no. Okay, then it's a boom, 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 you know. And they'd take detention, you know, and then have their parents come and pick it up. You know, it's just, I mean, it was amazing. But at the middle school, they don't have any trouble with that. I mean, they're just bam. And I, so, at least when I was there, there was a, a culture that was sneaking through with, with those cell phones and stuff. I don't know. It's a... Uh, it was a good battle. <laughs> yeah, I've heard things where like you have to put it in like a, a, a slot like on the door so then everybody can see everybody's phone is there, mm-hmm. you know, kind of like checking your bag at the door or something. Isn't that uh, just uh, – I just – you know, I think what needs to happen in education and probably every class should do it and they could is they they need to, to promote – like I had a classroom rules that were just um, – Two, basically. The rest were kind of comedic. But it was, um, I will, um, how did that go? I will treat, I will act in a kind, caring, and compassionate manner when I'm in the classroom. And if we could teach kids that and get support from homes, a lot of this stuff would go away. But not every home is a healthy environment. Yeah. Uh, that's what I try to teach my kids. Uh, whenever you're dealing with somebody who, who's reacting negatively or in a crazy manner, it's not it's not you. Something's happening in them. Mm-hmm. They're getting beat up at home or they didn't have breakfast. Uh, they're worried about money. Like you can't you, in most situations, you can't hold somebody truly accountable for exactly what they're doing because you don't know what's going on in their life. Mm-hmm. Well, it's like Oscar Wilde says, you know, we're all in the gutter. Well, we got one eye to the stars. <laughs> you know? Yeah. I I go back. We, we did um, pieces of Plato's Republic. And uh, probably the most important one is the cave, uh, the allegory of the cave where – um, the prisoner in the cave is kind of like what we've been talking about. This is your life. You know, you're seeing shadows of reality. You're not seeing truth. You're not seeing it in its perfect form. And Socrates 
supposition was that if one could see truth in all of its beauty, in all of its perfection, could readily see it and appreciate it and know it, why would they choose anything else? Yeah. And, but we're locked in a cave, we're chained, oops. And that's all we see is the shadows of what society deems is important, a bunch of puppet guys, you know. And only when the prisoner's freed and he starts his journey out of the cave and the pain of that, the truth, the sunlight hitting his eyes, he's gonna make mistakes going out. And if he, and when he finally gets out and he comprehends beauty and all the glory that's out there and, and just absolute nirvana. Yeah. What's the one thing that would keep him from experiencing heaven in its perfect state? What would be the one thing that would keep heaven from being perfect? I don't know. Knowing that your brothers and sisters are trapped in the cave uh -oh. and can't experience that. Mm -hmm. So reluctantly he goes, he knows there's a better life out here. So he goes down, stumbling, because his eyes aren't adjusted. He tries to free them, tries to break their bonds, tries to lead them out of the cage. Sometimes he's caught. Sometimes he's whipped. Sometimes he's crucified <laughs> by the state. Mm -hmm. He was, you know, all those guys were, Buddha was that way. So was Christ, Muhammad, and his messages. You know, that it's all the same. And But... But people like cages. It's like Shawshank Redemption. Brooks mm -hmm. spends 60 years in prison and they finally let him go. And he's going to he's gonna hurt somebody so that they won't let him out because he's terrified of getting out. And he finally gets out. He's got to get a job as a bagger. And then he kills himself. Yeah. People like, they get used to whatever surrounds them and it's it's comfort people are scared of doing different things and the older you get the less likely you are to try anything that's unfortunately true i think that's why you got to get that going early with a kid having you know, the questions the the answers aren't easy that's why kids are so cool though right mm, yeah. like like yeah. my kids i mean they're they're finally coming into that where they're more self-aware of everything. But when they're super young, they don't care about anything. They, they're not going to get embarrassed. Uh, they're not going to mm -hmm. – they're just so pure and free. They don't care about any of that stuff. Yeah. They – you know, it's it's wonderful to watch them grow. High school kids are freshmen are like that, man. Whew. I was in my wife's second grade classroom. <laughs> this is a funny story. So she taught second grade at Chenoweth for 30-some years. And when we were first married, I'd help her grade some papers. I was, I was seven. I didn't have a full-time job yet. So give me those tests. I'll grade them for you. So I'm sitting there like this. Well, it's right around Halloween. So I'm <laughs> drawing werewolves and Frankenstein monsters. And, nice job, Billy. <laughs> <laughs> you know, fangs and blood, you know, color and... I did all this test, and I put them in their deal. So I didn't think anything of it. She came home from school. She says, oh, my God, you didn't. <laughs> so I was in trouble. She says, you're coming to school tomorrow. They want to meet the artist. <laughs> so I come walking to the school. And I was a hero. Felt so good. These little second readers, sit at my table. We're drawn today. You know? <laughs> God, I, I draw about, you know, stick figure kind of stuff. But, yeah. um, it was so cool to see that. You know, they were just so open. Freshmen were so open, uh -huh. you know. Seniors, I didn't really enjoy teaching seniors because they were done. Yeah. You know, they were done. And I suppose I was like that too. But um, the thing I've tried to communicate to them, I don't care what you're learning, you know. A high school education, you're going to have to have something after it. It's going to have to be an apprentice. Like my son... My middle son just got a history degree from Portland State. Mm. But he's working on cars, Nissan, <laughs> and he's he's loving it. Mm -hmm. But he's prepared, you know. That gave him a base. It's like it's like my brother. He uh, went to Oregon State for four years, didn't take a degree, but he went to Key West. 
um, became a plumber. And then he became an arborist, and he had a business, and he was he was making really good money down there. And uh, I said, "What was the most important class you took at the Dallas High School when you were going to school?" Uh, art classes and English classes. I said, why? And he said, so I could communicate to people and the drawing and the creativity part of it. But he was a hands-on guy. I mean, he, he loved to sawzall and he loved to saw big saws. You know, it was just, it was huge for him. And he made a really good living. And what I try to tell kids, <clears throat> if you're an electrician or a plumber, carpenter, they're not going to outsource your job. They're not going to send a toilet to India to get it fixed. Yeah. You know, and that's something you have to look forward and have some guidance on that because those are going to be things that are going to be there. And if that's your passion, I mean, do you remember Dr. Death, Robert May? Hmm. Well, he's, he's the owner of Two Dogs Plumbing, okay. you know, and he's saved my bacon more than once because uh, – I get tools in my hand and stuff breaks. And I said, Robert? <laughs> and he comes to the rescue. But, you know, he's one of those kids that um, he's right around Clark Price, Derek Price, and those guys. That I think oh, they're older than you are. They're older. But um, those are the things we need to be promoting. When we, we cut back, it's usually they're going to cut PE, they're going to cut art, music, and <laughs> Those are all stimulate the brain. Yeah, and kids get excited for those. They get excited and they learn from it. Well, you know what else is the other thing, and this just popped in my head. Why why can't they – and maybe they do and I don't know it because I haven't been in school for 20 years. But why can't they focus more on finance and how to how to get credit cards and not go in debt and be responsible? And Because there's so many people that make bad decisions and ruin their credit score directly out of high school? It's critical thinking. It's like what you just talked about with all those little mems hitting them all the time and those little uh, algorithms or logarithms or... Algorithms, yeah. Algorithms. Yeah. Uh, they're, getting, they're getting brainwashed. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that's huge. You know, look at Sugar Frosted mm -hmm. Frakes, Tony the Tiger, you know. One of the worst things you can eat for a kid, for an adult. And yet it's out there all the time, mm -hmm. you know. Um, credit cards are like sugar, <laughs> real easy, really, oh, yeah. you know. And so I don't know, money's not real to them unless they get a job yeah. and they start trading their time, which is really all we have is time. We're trading our time yeah. for cash. Yes. And they need to understand that concept. Uh, but I was in a class with Mr. Rowland. Again, it was a futures class, and we were getting trained. It was really a, opened my eyes. And they started talking about terminations in America, how many people are terminated a year, and the percentages of why they were terminated. 92% of all people that are terminated in this country were terminated not because they couldn't get the job done, not because they weren't educated enough to handle it, they couldn't get along with people. Mm -hmm. So they would find an excuse, oh, he's been tardy this time, they're gone. You know? And I've seen it in education where they've done that with teachers. And we lost a good one that way because they challenged the situation. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that goes back to um, early tribes and, and sitting around the campfire. And you needed the warmth and the shelter and the camaraderie of the group. And if you were an outcast for some reason – they chuck you in the woods and you're done. Mm -hmm. So you have to you have to conform a certain amount to fit in with everybody. But I hear what you're saying. If you don't challenge the system a little bit, then then you're just going through the motions, and that's so unrewarding to know that you could do something better and have to continue the status quo. Well, you have the danger of a Hitler if you don't, you know. And I think the founding fathers, when you look at those guys, they were slave owners. They were this and that. But they were tired of being dominated, and they, they knew a better way, and they were highly educated. Mm -hmm. I mean, stuff that they were reading, and they could write. It's just um, – the word discipline is probably overused, but it's, uh, it's kind of like a job. You're willing to give up some time 
for a greater outcome. And I think, I think students need to understand that, that your focus is in here. You only got, you only got 50 minutes in class. Then you got to wait 24 hours before you come back. Kids don't understand time. Yeah. They're immortal. And I, I was that way. I was too. You don't get it. And then people like me or you try to tell somebody something and they're like, whatever. <laughs> but it's so true. You don't. That's all you get. And you don't know how long it's going to last. Mm -hmm. I don't care how much money I make. I can't get more time. Mm -hmm. I need as much time as I can get. I'm not going to... I'm not going to work 80 hours a week if I don't have to. Yeah. I want to go I want to go to the river. I want to hang out with my kids. Oh, I, I was at this uh, wine store. Every now and then a little of the grape. <laughs> <sighs> so, my wife was shopping at Selwood beautiful area, a bunch of antiques. I go in and this guy's sitting there. And I said, uh, he goes, "Invite me. Would you like to taste some wine?" It's free. Go ahead. What would you like? Guy was from France. So we started talking. He said, you Americans work too much. You know, they have like a month holiday paid vacations over there. I mean, they, they enjoy life. And it's not, first time I was in New York City, second time I was in New York City, third time I was there. Same thing. It's just a bam, 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 bam. That's the heartbeat of the city. And people are just pushed along at the end of the workday. They collapse in front of stupid little waterfalls you and I wouldn't even look at because we've got the Columbia River. We've got Multnomah Falls. We've got beauty all around us, but mm -hmm. they're just going. <laughs> yeah. And I'm just going, this is a living. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, the focus became on productivity and profit. And so that's why people are eating cheeseburgers in their car in the five minutes between meetings. You know, you go to Europe and they shut everything down for an hour and a half. Mm -hmm. You can't do anything other than eat between yeah. one and three. Yeah. People it's, hang out. They drink. They have a good time. They talk. It's, it's a different pace. And that's what we're missing here. Um, big time. I was in a – I don't want to say an argument. We just had two different views. And this guy, we were – I happened to be coaching. It was in LeGrand. And this guy was a, probably a college professor came in, and he asked a question. What's the biggest thing that happened in 1964 that changed America? And I was thinking we went off the silver standard uh, transistors. No. Planned obsolescence. So you build crap that breaks down. And you go. So you're going to reward a vice and call it a virtue? Mm -hmm. And we had a discussion on that. You know, when you looked at people that, you know, like you look at a carpenter that can, you know, build a table like this and, you know, put some time into it and put the linseed oil and the stain and, oh, man, like an older house, like a Victorian house. You just got to – you got to admire that. Mm -hmm. We got to get back to that. Yeah. Where work and dedication is rewarded, you know. Um, I felt so sorry for the – People like at uh, Fred Meyer and other stores that weren't getting the opportunity to have a vaccine. And they were giving it to teachers first. I'm mm -hmm. going, those guys are frontliners, man. I mean, yeah. they're keeping us in groceries. But there wasn't an appreciation for what they did and what they sacrificed. I mean, working long hours and. Uh, yeah, the grocery stores never shut down. Never shut down. And I mean, if they would have, what would have happened? Yeah. <laughs> Panic. Yeah. And so we've got to get back to that rewarding um, craftsmanship and skills like that to some degree, an appreciation of it. And I, it still goes back to I'm going to be a kind, caring, compassionate mm -hmm. individual. I mean, if you can teach a kid that, the best way is telling them stories. Yeah. You know, they, they can buy into storytelling if it's well done. That's that's uh, that's the beauty of like anything that's interesting, is it's all a story. Mm -hmm. Songs are stories, books are stories, movies are stories. Uh, hanging out with your grandpa and hearing about the old days is stories. Everything interesting mm -hmm. is a story in some way or another. Mm -hmm. Well, I remember. <laughs> You know, talking about the Elliot or something. We always have a beginning and an end in our culture. You know, we, we've got to have a product. 
in the Mayan culture, they have a, a story, Daughter of the Sun. And the storyteller would come in and start telling the story around a campfire. People would fall asleep. They wouldn't hear the end of it because it didn't have an end. <laughs> it just kept going. <laughs> it just kept going. Yeah. And like that. we don't, you know, in our lives, we have to have a beginning. And, oops. Beginning and getting physical here. A beginning and an end. And it's like, wow, you know. Yeah. I wonder if that's from, I mean, it's got to be from a number of things, but there's a, there's a duality in most elements, there's a sun, there's a night, there's mm -hmm. good versus evil. People like, there's Republican, Democrat. People like to have, my side's the winner, your side's the loser. Yeah, It's, it's like this weird disconnect in the human brain where you have to, things have to be simple. Mm -hmm. You have to root for one thing. It's like sports too. You mm -hmm. root for one thing and you hate the other team. You know, I live in Boston, Red Sox. Don't, mm -hmm. don't wear that Yankees hat up here, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, it's better to fight those battles on a plane field than <laughs> with artillery. Yeah, it's true. <laughs> I, uh, those guys, I, yeah. Well, do you think there's any hope for, like, what, why can't they bring Harry Potter into the curriculum or the Hunger Games books. You know, why can't they? Obviously, there's some classics that are mm -hmm. great to mm -hmm. learn about, but you think p kids would get more interested if it was more modern and relevant? Well, when you read like Harry Potter and when you read the Hunger Games, even even The Hobbit, you know, he's they've borrowed from these older stories. For sure. And um, at the high school, I think we had teachers that were teaching the Hunger Games. Hmm. Um, you've, got, you've got two things, you got two things working. Um, you're gonna have a large portion of the students at the high school that are gonna try college. And if the first time they ever hear about Emily Dickinson is at college, they're gonna be in trouble. Yeah. Um, and I, my kids went to college, but I didn't say you're going to college. I said, you know, it's out there if you want it. Mm -hmm. I mean, on our in our family, we have a lot of mechanics, a lot of um, carpenters, a lot of people that do, build stuff. I wasn't blessed with that, but um, we gotta we gotta start. I hate, I hate to say this, but the Renaissance man is what we need. A guy skilled in all ways of contending. You can swing a hammer, swing a paintbrush, swing a pen. Mm -hmm. And that's that's really the goal. You gotta have a well rounded individual. Yeah. Especially in a republic. Otherwise we get people that shouldn't be in office mm -hmm. because they've been able to bring out the worst in people. Yeah. By looking at the seven deadly sins, you know, and just poking at their pride poking at their uh, anger, stirring them up. And once you get that animal brain going, you, know, you go reptile on somebody, you don't think critically. You just, you want to hit somebody. You want to bite somebody. Just, yeah. And that's the danger that I see um, in our society today. Nobody, they're not talking at all. You know, you're not either side. Yeah, it's, uh, it's frustrating when you are not allowed to have opinions that, go across the spectrum mm -hmm. and you say one thing and you're labeled as something and you're like, well, uh, that's not really who I am. I kind of, I'm a human and I like lots of things and I have lots of different opinions, but you say one specific thing and you're, yeah. you're that. You're pinned. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's, it's a very ineffective way to interact with people. Yeah. It's just, it's sad. They're missing out. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, just, uh, I remember as a teacher that uh, during his lunchtime, he'd go out and play basketball with kids. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, more of that needs to happen. Yeah. You know, and uh, meet him outside the classroom. That's why coaching was kind of neat because, you know, you'd go out there and you see these kids and you'd work with them and train them up. And uh, it was easy to coach somebody like a Tony Rowland, mm -hmm. you know, because he had some real natural ability and desire. And 
but to take somebody that's struggling in a, in a sport like wrestling, where it's one on one and in front of everybody, you know, that was really, you know, making those kids grow. That was huge. Well, yeah, that's rewarding for you and for them, right? Mm -hmm. You're kind of like a team. Yeah. yeah, and you know, it's um, it's about that. I wrote this paper about Jacob wrestling the angel. And he's waiting for him on the, in the Old Testament, he's waiting for him on the edge of this river and this, this man walks towards him. And it's getting dark and they wrestle all night. They go back and forth and he's asking for a blessing and he gets in there and he's got a, a leg and at the end as the dawn's coming up, the angel whacks him. That could be Christ, it could be God. Whacks him on the hip and he walks with a limp. Mm -hmm. He was asking for a blessing <clears throat> and um, to me, that this light and dark imagery and the cost of attaining um, knowledge or appreciation, it's going to cost you something. And I don't think <clears throat> kids really understand that. It's going to cost you time in a classroom. It's going to cost you time outside of your, you know, the, the only currency we have to improve your paradigm, your perspective, your viewpoints, it's going to take some time. You're going to have to dig through some books. You're going to have to dig through media. Um, if all you watch is Fox News or CNN, you're hurting big yeah, time. For sure. Even if you slam them together, you're hurting mm -hmm. big time because all they want is ratings. They don't really care. They want to get people fired up. Yeah. And become habitual users. It's like a drug, you know. <laughs> it's totally a drug. And you just sit there and you just go selling out the country. When I was growing up, you had Walter Cronkite, mm -hmm. and he was this way all the time. Now you've got these guys' emotions and everything coming into it. And yeah. It's a wild place. Wild place. Uh, well, you know what? We've done almost an hour and a half here, so I think that's a good spot to shut it down. So I appreciate you well, coming this is, down. This was fun. Yeah, I had a good time. It's, uh, it's easy once you get gone. Yeah. You start rolling through it.